the FQHEs for many years um, and strate strategically helped many of the grantees um, connect and improve outreach services to connect with residents in public housing. So we're in for a wonderful presentation today. In addition to that, today's audience will include not only health centers, but also primary care associations, some of our national corporate agreement partners, and our housing authority um, partners as well. So we do know that in order to provide quality of primary care to residents in public housing, it is very, very important to discuss issues such as outreach and uh, strategies to um, encourage residents to, to seek care in community health centers. And basically, at the end of today's presentation, you will have many of those ideas that you can take back into your communities. And you will also learn about ways to strengthen those partnerships so that the model is very successful. We are really delighted uh, with the passage of the Affordable Care Act um, to have um, HRSA fund our federally qualified health centers who provide the care and services. But what we found worked extremely well for them in this model are all the stakeholder partners involved in the process as well. So we bring this webinar to you today. We ask that you will please hold all your questions until the end of the presentation. We have built in a few um, minutes for questions and answers. And please know that this webinar today will be archived and available on our website um, following the conclusion of this webinar present presentation. So again, thank you for joining us today. And without further ado, I would like to turn it over to our speaker for today, uh, Mr. David Vincent. Thank you, David. Great. Thank you, Dr. Webb. Welcome, everyone, to PHPC 101, which is Public Housing Primary Care 101. As Dr. Webb shared, my name is David Vincent. I'm actually calling in from New York City, so if you hear cars honking and uh, sirens in the background, don't worry, it's just a regular day here in New York City. And um, as Dr. Webb shared, I um, am a consultant with the National Center and have been working with them for, for several years. Uh, it, prior to joining them as a consultant, I was uh, a director of a public housing primary care site in San Diego for several, several years and uh, was very fortunate to work with them. So again, welcome to uh, today's webinar. And as Dr. Webb shared, we have a very, very diverse group. So some of today's presentation may be um, information you know already, those in the CHC movement, community health center movement. Um, and some of it may be new information for people. So um, I'm trying to play to a general audience. So, uh, so welcome, welcome. So let's get started. The, okay, let's see how I'm getting going here. There we go, the history of the PHPC movement. So um, back in 1990, uh, the Public Health Service Act was amended to include the Disadvantaged Minority Health Improvement Act. And this really was the very beginning of the public housing primary care program. And uh, um, they actually call it the Health Services for Public Housing Residents Program. But we um, in the field actually call it the PHPC program. So um, one of the cornerstones in the PHPC program really includes that the programs need to be located on the premises of public housing or immediately located um, accessible to public housing residents. We'll talk a little bit later about what that looks like and uh, many different projects throughout the country do this very differently differently. So um, if you're interested in starting a new PHPC program and are wondering what it would look like and don't have space available at your public housing site, don't worry because there are many different um, health centers that have this grant that do it completely different. So no worries on that. We can talk more about that and I'll answer questions on that a little bit later as well. So um, in 1996, all of the um, the uh, health centers joined together in what is called the uh, Consolidated Act. This is the Health Center Consolidated Act that joined 
together all of the Healthcare for the Homeless programs, Migrant Health Center programs, and the Public Housing Primary Care programs under one act, which is called Section 330. For those of you that aren't public, uh, aren't health centers, Section 330 is a very common term that uh, we use in the community health center world, and that really encompasses so many different programs. And uh, this act was reauthorized in 2006. So when we think about 330, there are several different types of 330s. The big, large 330 grant that many health centers have is called the 330E. Um, 330G is the migrant health center, 330H is the health care for the homeless, and 330I is the public housing primary care program. So um, most health centers, I would say the, the vast majority of health centers, community health centers out there that are federally qualified community health centers, have something that's called the 330E grant. So that's the large community health center grant. Not all health centers have the 330G, 330H, 330I. Those three grants are actually called the special population grants. And each community health center that's interested in serving those populations has to apply specifically to the federal government to receive one of those grant awards. So, those uh, community health centers that receive public housing primary care funding have actually applied for 330i funding, went through the whole application. Um, if they um, are interested in just starting from the very beginning, they usually have to apply for a 330e program and then additionally a 330i program. However, there are health centers that just have 330i funding. And those that are interested in hearing more about that, I'll be happy to talk to you a little bit further about that a little bit later. So in 1991, we had our first PHPC program funded. So there were actually seven health centers that received PHPC funding back in 1991. And these health centers are very fortunate. We still with uh, the PHPC, PHPC family and are really leaders within the PHPC movement. So there is the Ella Austin Health Center, which is now known as, as Commutera down in San Antonio, Texas. The Family Practice Counseling Network, which is out in Philadelphia. The Great Hill Neighborhood Health Center is out in St. Louis, Missouri. The Great Brook Valley Health Center, which is now known as the uh, Edward Kennedy Health Center out in Worcester, Massachusetts. The Primary Care Health Center out in Pittsburgh. In Pittsburgh. Uh, the clinic at Alkett, which is now known as TCA Health out in Chicago, and the West End Medical Centers, which is out in Atlanta. Again, these are all programs that are still in the PHPC family and um, really are wonderful programs and have several best practices. And anyone that's interested in starting a PHPC program, um, these are really some of the cornerstone programs that uh, are worthy of a visit or a phone call. Um, continuing on, there are 61 PHPC grantees throughout the country, and they are in 24 states throughout the country, including Puerto Rico. Um, these programs, just as, as a part of the mission of the PHPC program, provide high-quality, comprehensive case managed and family-based preventive care and public health services to uh, almost 200,000 residents at over 711 public housing sites, which is an absolutely amazing number of um, residents that are receiving health care through this PHPC program. Um, when we look at sort of who's hosting today's call, so uh, the National Center for Health and Public Housing receives an award from, from HRSA to provide technical assistance to uh, the PHPC community, those that are already receiving PHPC funding, as well as those that are really interested in starting their own PHPC program. So today's webinar is actually sponsored by uh, the National Center uh, for Health and Public Housing, uh, in addition to HRSA. Um, so as I shared, the National Center provides a wealth of training opportunities. There are regional trainings and national trainings, newsletters, white papers, listservs, and webinars. And I believe because you have submitted your email information, I believe you are fortunate enough to be added to that listserv. 
and uh, should be receiving more information. One additional part of note here is that I believe the next national training should be held in Denver this year. So uh, look forward for that information coming uh, in upcoming months. It's a wonderful training opportunity. You do not need to be a, a recipient of PHPC funding to attend this. Actually, many um, those that are interested in in, attend, in receiving funding actually do find this conference to be of, of value. So um, if you're interested in attending, uh, please, please attend. Um, when we look at the patients served by the PHPC program, it's had some significant growth. So patient encounters, what is a patient encounter for those that aren't in the community health center world? This is actually needs patient visits. So um, you can see that back in 06, we had about half a million patient visits during the, um, the calendar year. To um, this past year, we had uh, 884,000 uh, patient visits. How does this break down into um, to PHPC world. So I think we, we, uh, we believe that each patient probably has about 2.4 or 2.6 visits um, during a calendar year. So um, several people come more than once to uh, see their medical provider. Um, as I shared a little bit earlier, we had 187,000 residents that were served uh, this past year. And you can see over the last uh, several years, there's been some significant, significant growth within the PHPC program. And um, I, can, I, I expect for this number to continue. As you can see, just the difference between 2010 and 2011, there's been some significant growth. And this is really just about new uh, PHPC grantees joining the family and uh, providing care to residents in public housing. Um, when we look at the fiscal status, so how much money people, um, what, what the financial breakup is of individuals who are part of the program, the blue line indicates those that are at 100% below poverty, and the red line indicates those that are 150% below poverty. So um, this is not a surprise because part of living in, in public housing means that you are probably at some level of, of poverty in your household. So the residents that participate in the PHBC program that are 100% below poverty is probably about 83 to 84%. Those that are 150% are at about 93%. So this is really a program that's really a safety net program that's really reaching so many individuals that are at poverty and have very, very few resources. When we look at the insurance status, and I, I trended this over several years, just so you can really see how it's trended. The black at the top of those bars indicates the percentage of individuals that are uninsured. And you can see back in 04, there was a very large percent of individuals that were uninsured. And over the years, that number has um, decreased significantly. Um, however, you know, if you look at the difference between 2010 and 2011, you can see that that number of uninsured actually is, incre is increasing a little bit. It's hard to know whether that's just a fluctuation of the year or if that's going to um, continue, but there has been some increase over, over the last year. Additionally, the number of commercially insured uh, PHPC residents that are participating in receiving health care with PHPC grantees has pretty much remained the same. It's, I believe it's about 5 or 6 percent. As well, the number of residents who have Medicaid, Medicare has remained pretty pretty stable over the last number of years as, as well. I think that's about 4%. The number of individuals with, on Medicaid has um, also increased, but did decrease slightly over the last year. So it will be interesting to see um, next year, when we get next year's data, if that number has uh, stabilized or if we continue to see the trend of more uninsured folks being served and uh, with less um, insurance. Um, as we look at the age and gender of the typical PHPC patient, 37% of PHPC individuals are between the ages of 0 and 19 years old. And why is this important? So this is really a program that is significantly uh, serving uh, residents that are uh, 
to the age of 19. So when you're thinking about your program design, this is an important part to take into consideration. Obviously, different communities um, have different statistics in their uh, housing authority, so it will be important to look at what the data is from your local housing authority when you're designing your program. Additionally, 25% of these of our patients are between the ages of 0 and 12 years old. 5% are over the age of 65. This number has remained pretty stable over the last number of years as well. Additionally, female patients uh, represent about 62% of PHPT patients. That, that's uh, a very important fact when you're thinking about how to design your program and making sure you have um, services for your female patients. When we think about what, pe what people are going to uh, their providers for, there is a report that all grantees must submit every single year, and that is called the UDS, which is the Universal Data Set. And everyone submits these reports. And these reports, these data, actually indicate um, a primary diagnosis. So this is the first the first diagnosable um, thing in, in, um, uh, diagnosed in someone's chart. So someone who is on this list may also have a co-occurring diagnosis. But right now, this is just looking at the top diagnosis, initial diagnosis for the residents in PHPC program. The, the uh, number of pac patients that have depression and mood disorders has increased very, very significantly over the last uh, couple of years. This depression and mood disorders used to be about number four or number five on this list, but actually over the last couple of years, this, uh, this depression has really increased significantly among residents in public housing. What does that mean? Does that mean that we're seeing more depressed people? Yes, but is that a, that more people are depressed than they were in years past, or that we're doing a better job diagnosing them and providing services? It's a little hard to, to tell what's really happening. But what we do know is that people are coming to their PHPC program and they're being diagnosed with depression or other mood disorders, which is, uh, which is a great thing because they're now in uh, a system of care to receive treatment. Right up there in, after depression is hypertension. Of, of, large number of residents in public housing have hypertension followed by diabetes. One of the, one of the most uh, popular services that PHPC programs provide are vaccinations. As we saw in some of the prior slides that we do have a large number of young people, 25% of our young people are under the age of 12. So vaccinations are very, very uh, a popular service within the PHPC program. Uh, oral health exams, just basic dental screenings and cleanings are, are um, often services provided at PHPC programs, as well as health supervision. So these are really the well child visits that uh, kids receive that are uh, under the age of 11. Additionally, contraceptive, contraceptive management is a very popular service among PHPC programs, which not surprising, as 62% of our of our patients are female patients. So this number is very high, and um, this service is being provided to many of those female patients. When we look at the health status of just residents in public housing, now this this data that that we're looking at, when where it says black women in public housing, this was a study done in 2007 which looked at HOPE6 projects. And for those that aren't familiar with the HOPE6 movement, it's a, a, a really um, innovative public housing model, which uh, you can Google and find out far more information uh, about. It's about mixed income and, and breaking down some of those larger public housing sites and integrating public housing res residents further in the community. So, I know that's a sort of uh, very general oversight, so please forgive me for, for doing that. So when we look at, at black women who are self-reporting their health status from fair to poor, we look at young women who are aged 18 through 24, 6% of them say that their 
health is from bare to poor. That's compared to 10% of women in the general U.S. population, and then 26% of black women in public housing. These numbers continue to increase significantly with um, age. So those 45 to 64, 58% of black women rate their health from fair to poor. And an uh, astonishing and disturbing fact for um, black women in public housing that are 65 years old, 65% of them rate their health from fair to poor. It's a very horrible state of health for um, black women in public housing. Continuing, when we look at just some of the health conditions that that our black women are facing in public housing, 14% of black women in the U.S. Uh, say that arthritis is a big concern for them. 29% of them have that as a large concern for them in public housing. Asthma, 23% of women in public housing, black women in public housing have asthma, and then obesity is a, an epidemic form in public housing where 48% of black women have obesity. When we think about some of the other chronic illnesses, depression is, is extremely high among black women in public housing at 14%, diabetes at 17%, and hypertension at 39%. Uh, very, all very, very disturbing uh, statistics. When we look at, this is a study that was done in Boston, in the Boston public housing area, looking at their residents in public housing. And poor nutrition really significantly impacted uh, the weight of many residents. Not surprising, we know that anecdotally. This study actually does provide some statistically sound information on um, how nutrition and the unavailability of healthy foods has just impacted the weight of many other residents. 31% of, of these residents in the study were considered to be obese. That was compared to 16% of the general population in this Boston study. Then they did uh, an interesting thing looking at oral health. And they rated poor oral health as missing six or more permanent teeth. 23% of residents in Boston public housing were missing six or more permanent teeth. That's 23%. That's a, a crazy amount of, of residents compared to 12% of the general population. Very sort of disturbing fact. Uh, they continued to look at smoking. And as we know, that smoking really impacts uh, the chronic health conditions of so many uh, conditions for individuals. 28% of residents in public housing smoked, and that, that's compared to 17% of the general population. Um, diabetes is overrepresented in the study as well, with 12% of them having diabetes compared to 5% of the general population. And then additionally, 32% uh, of them had hypertension compared to 19% of the general population all just very, very disturbing statistics and all really lead to the need for an intervention, an on-site aggressive public health intervention to help improve the health status of these residents. So uh, what we do know, where, where, where are, what, what's the makeup of public housing throughout the country? There are 2.2 residents living in traditional public housing. This data, the numbers are a little bit old and may have been updated recently, uh, so please forgive me if, if there, are, there are more updated statistics. Additionally, 6.5 million live in Section 8 and housing, or have housing choice vouchers. So for those that, that aren't familiar with Section 8 and housing choice vouchers, in some communities, housing choice vouchers have replaced Section 8 vouchers. And in some communities, they have two separate pools of funding, one for Section 8 housing and one for housing choice vouchers. So if you're interested in applying for the PHPC program, you want to figure out where your Section 8 individuals are. And are they Section 8 vouchers or are they housing choice vouchers? Are they centrally located? Are they in scattered sites? And that's really important when you look at designing your PHPC program because this program is really 
driven by actual public housing location. So they think of public housing in the most traditional form. Uh, that's really what the, the uh, program is meant to serve those individuals. However, you have large concentrations that of Section 8 vouchers that are close to public housing, your public housing site. That's an important fact to highlight in your application to uh, better uh, explain your need for this intervention. 20, when people think about residents in public housing, they're always like, oh, you know, people live in public housing for years and years and years. They go from generation to generation to generation. While some of that may be true, actually only 21% of them, of residents, live in public housing for over five years. Um, what is more, more um, significant to this conversation is that 17% of residents also remain in the Section 8 program for more than five years. So these individuals really are using the public housing program, what it's, what's it intended to be is really as a safety net for residents to sort of stabilize their economic situation and move back into the community more independently with, um, without the assistance of federal government and local authorities. What many residents in public housing face are disabilities. 19% of residents who live in public housing have a disability. 17% in Section 8 and 18% um, in Housing Choice Vouchers. And this is for individuals who have a family member as well who are disabled. So this is either the primary caregiver is disabled or someone in their household is disabled. Um, there are over a million children who live in public housing. They represent 40% of the total population of residents who live in public housing. This is young people who are under the age of 18, which is an astronomical number. Um, 2.3 million children live in Section 8 housing, and um, that represents about 47% of residents who live in Section 8 housing. That's a very, very high amount. When we think of uh, single family, single, I'm sorry, single female headed households with children, they represent about 37% of public housing and 22% of Section 8, and 48% of housing choice households. When we look at seniors, uh, they're about 15, they represent about 15% of the public housing community. This is an interesting stat because, as you remember from earlier on, we're only, the PHPC programs are actually only seeing about 5% of seniors in their public housing program. So, uh, as you know, Medicare provides a lot more opportunities for, um, for seniors, so this is actually nice that this number is actually um, a lower statistic, and that means that there, the Medicare program has been successful in moving those that have Medicare into the general population of medical providers and not needing safety net providers as much as some of the other populations do. Um, going on. When, for those that are interested in reaching residents of public housing, it's really just about taking a step back and thinking about developing that outreach plan. What is it going to look like? What, first of all, what, what's the goal? What, what is the need? Is the need to provide general services to, general health care services to this population? Is this need to um, bring them to your health center? Is this need to go there for their health center? Is it to, you know, really looking at a very specific need and really developing those goals and objectives? Obviously, you know, making sure those goals are, are measurable will always be something that you want to strive to do. Definitely, if you're interested in, in applying for PHPC funding, you want to look at making sure those goals are measurable. This is an important part of your, your application to the federal government is making sure your goals are measurable. Additionally, you want to um, uh, identify what community partners, so obviously your local housing authority is your primary community partner, but who else are some of your other community partners? Your local Head Start program, your local Girl Scout group, your, you know, your community center, all of these are key partners. Anyone that's serving this community um, is a natural partner and an 
I'm sure definitely is interested in improving the health status of residents in public housing. When you think about developing an outreach plan, really figure out what outreach is going to look like. And if it is, are you going to do it during the day, during the weekend? Where, when are people going to be home? You know, if you do it during the day, will residents be home or will a number of them be working or will the kids be in school? And really trying to be strategic and mindful when you're developing this plan. Having a training module that you set up for your outreach workers is a very important thing. You don't want to send someone out into the community if you have not trained them sufficiently on the services that you provide in your health center. An important piece that to consider also during your training module is how to keep your outreach workers safe, making sure that they uh, have a safety plan, that they're always paired up to make sure that they're not going into unsafe communities, and that they know where their local resources are if they need to find them very quickly. And then another key point is about recruiting staff. And let's talk a little bit more about recruiting staff. How do I get this to go? Oh. Oops, I'm having a few problems here, so excuse me. Okay, outreach workers. So when you're looking at defining who is an effective outreach worker, it's really looking at your community leaders. And who are your community leaders? Um, a community leader are oftentimes someone who might be on one of the resident advisory boards or might be active in the local senior center. You, they really, um, they do present themselves and local housing authorities can identify them in a second. You know, they know who who is the leader in this, in this building, who's the, who's who knows the issues of the building, of the community, who's been around for years, who, who is always the first one to volunteer to help clean up after a local public housing event. Those people are really the issues. When you think about using residents, you can't sort of go in blindly. You do need to acknowledge that there are significant challenges and issues that come with having residents in, as employees. Confidentiality is by far the biggest concern. Uh, making sure that you have a very clean, clear outreach um, worker policy about confidentiality. You don't want to have an outreach worker that's known as a gossip that's going to say, oh, I saw Mrs. Jones come in the clinic. You know, she came in because she had an STD. You know, like that's going <laughs> to, nothing would bring your program down faster than having a staff member share information about um, residents coming into your program. So really acknowledging that there are certain uh, issues that need to be discussed in working with residents. Um, additionally, looking to your public housing authority when you're working with them to help identify these residents is a really key thing. As I shared earlier, the tenant advisory boards are always great resources for, for identifying outreach workers and leaders in that, as well as floor captains and those that are attending those meetings. Um, okay, I'm sorry. Um, additionally, when you're thinking about doing outreach to public housing residents, really defining what your service is. Are you going to go door to door and do outreach, or are you going to table at some community event? Figuring out what your strategy can be as well as having a multi-pronged approach is really um, a, a good recommendation because you really want to cast that net as wide as possible when you're trying to spread new, spread the service. Those that are interested in applying for PHBC funding, remember that your application requires you to have consumer patient feedback into your application. So. This is something that you really need to start thinking about, going to your housing authority saying, can you recommend a number of people for me to host a focus group to talk about what healthcare issues? So this is all stuff you need to start thinking about. Additionally, when you're thinking about your outreach strategy, we talked about safety concerns a little bit, uh, but also think about hard to reach areas. There are so many uh, public housing communities that 
you know, for instance, in New York City, some of them have very poor public transportation to in and out of those communities and trying to figure out how to get in those communities for your employees, for your residents to get to your health center, all of that, all of those issues are going to be really important in your program design. Uh, and then additionally, what is it going to look like if you have scattered sites? So for instance, when I was a PHPC director in San Diego, San Diego has several scattered sites of public housing, some of them, you know, 50 miles apart from each other. That's, that's an important piece to take into consideration when you're designing your PHPC program. Additionally, when we think about, sorry, trying to change this thing, there we go, becoming a PHPC grantee. Um, there is, as I shared, an important part of the PHPC program application is about having consumer contribution to your application. Another part of your application must include a copy of the memorandum of understanding with your local housing authority. So you want to collaborate right from the very, very beginning with your local housing authority on this process. You know, you can't, I can't sort of stress this enough. So if you don't include the, the housing authority or the community health center equally in this process, the chances of you having communication issues further down the line are very, very likely. So making sure that you're both all on the same page about what this project will look like, your goals, your objectives are completely in concert is a very important part of um, this requirement. Um, just a, a little FYI, that MOUs can sometimes be hard to develop, but please know that there is a sample that is available on the uh, National Center's website. So you don't have to start from scratch, so don't worry about that because I know that they can be sometimes hard and you're not really sure what to include. So just go to the National Center for an example of that MOU and it will highlight some of the basic elements to include in an MOU. As most of you know, grant opportunities for the PHPC program and federal programs can be found at grants.gov. Please look at that website frequently. Sign up for their distribution list because I anticipate some funding announcements coming out very soon. So please, um, please do look at this website frequently for opportunities. Additionally, as I shared, um, having a relationship, housing authority, having a relationship with the resident and tenant organization is really key to the delivery of services. So those programs that are most successful in the PHPC community have very, very strong relationships with their resident and tenant organizations. So presenting to them, getting them to participate in your focus groups, their, uh, you know, any, any opportunity to include resident and tenant organizations in this process and in the delivery of care as ongoing evaluation and, and uh, providing feedback into your program is really key to the success of your PHPC program. Um, cannot, cannot stress that enough. And, um, you know, you want to make sure that when you're designing a program, you want to make sure that it really represents the need of your program. You know, if you're going to design a program that that doesn't meet the, the need, for instance, if this public housing community has 65% of the residents are under the age of 12, then you want to make sure that you have a large pediatric practice. If you know that the majority of residents suffer from some chronic health condition like asthma, you want to make sure that that's represented in your program. And um, doing that from the initial start is really very important. And that information is best obtained with the resident and tenant organizations. Um, and I talked about this next bullet already. I don't need to re repeat that one. One of, the app, one of the key components of the application is the development of a needs assessment. So, uh, for those of you that haven't done a needs assessment before, see or not, there is a toolkit that is also available on the National Center's website. And this really breaks down how to conduct a needs assessment specifically to residents in public housing. So
So some of the key pieces that are in that needs assessment is looking at your public housing development and you have to take a step back and you say, okay, what zip code is this in? Is it in a high poverty area zip code? All of this stuff makes sense to those individuals who are in the CHC world. Those of, the, those of you that are part of housing authorities, please work with your uh, local community health center who has to submit the application. They'll know exactly and they'll sort of walk you through this part. But while you're doing that, you're the ones that will be providing your local community health center with the, va with the very basics of, of who is who are residents in this public housing community? What are their local, what are their demographics? Are they seniors? Are they kids? Are they more individuals of color? Are, do you know any public health information on this community? Has anyone done a survey of this community? Do you know if chronic health conditions are best served? Do you um, have, do you know how many of these residents are already engaged in public uh, primary health care services? Do you know how many of them are insured? Do you know how many of them aren't uninsured? Having this information will be really helpful in your application as those are critical required pieces in your application. Additionally, um, thinking about what are the community agencies that are located in this public housing area? Is there a local hospital that's close? Is there a community health center? Are there local nonprofits, the tenant, tenant rights, tenant advocacy organizations? Are these uh, community agencies that are possible partners to um, implement your PHPC program? Who's already working with these people? You really want to try to not duplicate and not exclude anyone that's already working with them. You know, you're also, as you're doing this needs assessment, you're also thinking about, okay, who can give me a linkage agreement? Because you're going to want to include linkage agreements in your um, application as well. So, for instance, if a tenant advocacy organization has been working with this public housing community for years and years and years, you definitely should have a linkage agreement with them. You, you, would, you would be absent if you didn't. Um, and then you think about what type of partnerships might be available. If you have a large number of residents under the age of five in your public housing community and there's also a Head Start program, you probably want to partner with them in some way. Um, community partnerships really are, are key critical steps to the success of PHPC programs. Um, what's important in the PHPC program when you're thinking about it? Um, as, we, as we discussed earlier, PHPC programs need to be provided on site or close by to the uh, local housing community. However, when I was in San Diego, our communities were so scattered that it would be impossible to our design to have six or seven different smaller health centers located. So we actually purchased a mobile medical unit and used a mobile medical unit to go to all of those public housing communities work for us in San Diego, would it work as well here in New York City? You know what I mean? So you have to sort of think about what your local community um, best, their needs are best met by. So important to think about that service delivery mod model. Um, also, thinking about how transportation, an issue, you know, I'll go back to my San Diego experience. Um, public transportation in San Diego, I hope there's no one from the Transit Authority on this call, um, can be very, very limited in San Diego. So if you are a senior in San Diego and you need to access public transportation or your provider is you know, on the other side of town, it's going to take you a while to get on that public transit bus in order to get to your provider. And you know, you have you you're a young mom who has three kids and you have a sprained foot and you're trying to access public transportation, you know, thinking about what model in the best reflects the transportation and the community needs is really important. Are you going to build on site? Are you going to spread it out? All of those pieces are all very, very important. Um, you know, you want to make sure that you're staffing, as I shared earlier, so if you have a large number of, of Young kids on your site, having a pediatric, strong pediatric component is very important. 
to your program design and your staffing model. Um, additionally, this is always, I mean, everyone knows this, so I, I shouldn't say this because everyone knows this, but it's really answering those five W's in that age. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. Those are really, if you, those that, that write grant applications will tell you that having those basic pieces in your grant application really are key to successful grant applications. I'm not, I'm not telling you something that you all don't know. So, um, An important component of your application is really receiving a letter of support from your primary care organization. This is a requirement of your grant application, so working with your local, with your state PCA in your application is, um, is important to your process. Additionally, as I shared before, an MOU must be also accompanied in your grant application, and that sample is on the website, so don't worry. Um, having a letter of support from your resident council, specifically noting how they've participated in the process, really is, is uh, considered to be a best practice in this application process. Because you, you do need to prove that residents did participate and there's no better way than actually having a signed document from the president of the local resident council saying, yes, I support community center XYZ in their application. We had several meetings to discuss this program and the program design and blah, blah, blah. Very, very important in your application. An important piece also is if you are working in reaching a public housing community but you have another health center that is in that community, remember that according to your application you must have a letter of support from that health center. So this is one of those hers of things. If you have a question about locality and someone else's jurisdiction and sort of making sure you're not stepping on a local community health center's toes, you know, consult with your HRSA project officer about the best way to do that. Um, you know, it's a, it's a very smart politically thing to do. I don't know if it's required, um, but I actually believe it might be, but I could totally be wrong with that. But definitely something you want to do um, in your process. When we, I think this is sort of the very last slide. Yes, it's the very last slide. So if you're inf interested in more information about the PHPC program, again, Feel free to go to that grants.gov website, contact the National Center, Dr. Webb, who spoke earlier in the call. Uh, her information is below. And the uh, HRSA project officer who's responsible for us for our project is Lieutenant Commander Kevin Bates, who actually might be on this call too. Hi, Kevin. Uh, and the Bureau of Primary Health Care, who, which is the department that oversees the PHPC program, that website's there. And if you're interested in learning more about the National Center for Health and Public Housing, their website is right there. So I think that that is it, and we have some time left to answer some questions. Devin, are you there? Devin? Um, yes, I am here. Um, I'll be sending you questions in a second. Um, yeah, so check your Q&A box. I just had that moment where I thought, oh my gosh, I just talked for an hour and I talked to dead space. So. <laughs> okay, um, we have a question about question on what is what are the data sources are they using? How old is the data? So. The data, as uh, the HOPE 6 data is back from uh, 2007, and the um, data on the public housing, I believe, is a little bit newer than that. I believe it might be 2008 or 2009, and again, the second um, information on uh, resident characteristics, that was from Boston, the Boston uh, Housing Authority. Um, Okay, we have another, what's the difference between Section 8 and housing choice vouchers? So, you know, I'm not a complete housing authority expert, so um, 
please forgive me if I if I say this incorrectly. In some communities, Section 8 and Housing Choice Vouchers are the same. And Section 8 is a process, an application process that individuals must do to receive subsidized um, assistance for um, rental assistance. Um, I think I should probably leave it at that because I, I hate to, to say more than I really should. Remember that when you're thinking about designing your PHPC program, you actually have to go not with Section 8 numbers. You actually have to go with your public housing numbers. So why you do want to try to serve Section 8 and Housing Choice voucher residents, your, your primary project must be traditional public housing. Yes, hi David. I just wanted to interject to that as well um, for the point of clarification because I know we have a, a lot of new health centers who are looking at the public housing primary care model um, as an opportunity for them. Um, and we, one of the things that we do know, um, it is very important that you work closely with the public housing authorities and determine with the housing authority if they're receiving operational funds directly from HUD. Uh, that does make a difference in terms of um, if the residents are receiving assisted um, vouchers, then um, there is a determination on the HRSA side um, that the housing authorities themselves must be receiving some um, operational assistance as well from HUD as opposed to just the housing authorities that only issue vouchers. So if that clarified a little bit, um, otherwise you're more than happy to contact us here at the National Center for Health and Public Housing, and we'll be able to help um, provide you with that information as well. And we have recently com um, compiled a group of uh, definitions um, related to public housing, and they are, all, they are on our website. Um, so we really encourage you as well um, to take a look at that for further clarification. Thank you. Great. There was a question about the cost-benefit analysis and the cost savings of using uh, community health centers. Um, that information actually is, avail is available. And to find more information about the cost saving, I would recommend that you visit the National Association of Community Health Centers, known as NAC. So that acronym, let me just spell that one more time, N -A, um, and their web, so nachc.org. They're a great resource for um, some statistics on this, on cost savings. Um, a copy of the presentation will be available on the, the um, National Center's website for those that are interested in receiving a copy of the slides. Um, there was a question. Dr. Webb, are you on the phone? I am. Okay, so there was a question about if we had any idea of when um, when we would be receiving notification of when grant, the grants might be available. Okay, uh, the last um, update that we had received um, from HRSA is that at some point during the fall, uh, they will they are considering releasing a new access point application. So um, we have not heard the actual official date, um, but we do know that uh, they do intend to try and put some kind of funding opportunity out sometime this fall. What we will do, we really encourage everyone, if you have not already done so, to please sign up on our mailing list on our website. Um, as soon as those announcements come out, we tend to send them out on listserv as well as post them on our website. So um, that is as much as we know at this point, but we do encourage you to consider some of the pointers and guidance that uh, David provided earlier in terms of what your applic grant application needs and really look at defining that demographic population that you desire to uh, reach through the PHPC site that you're proposing. Um, David, if you can just um, briefly comment, there are a couple of individuals who asked us about pursuing a purely 330i um, model. And if you can just um, briefly kind of give them the example of why is that different from 
a 330E with a 330I attached to it. Right. So a 330E, as, as uh, Dr. Webb was sharing, is the larger community health center. So if you were just interested in serving public housing residents and you, you, your housing authority, your partner housing authority said, yes, if we go into this funding together, you can move into this building, this new building or this old building, we'll convert this old building which is located right on site of this public housing community. You can move in there and we'll, we won't charge you any rent. Um, that might be a program that you're interested in going just for the PHPC funding. So um, this is sometimes a number game, and you're, you, um, you're going to have to think strategically about this. So um, there are a limited number of, within any grant opportunity, there might be, they'll fund 100 community health centers, they'll fund 10 They'll fund 20 healthcare for the homeless programs. They'll fund, you know, eight PHPC programs. So you have to think about how to play your odds when you're doing this. So some programs feel that they have a very strong PHPC only project and want to go in just for that. And some programs want to go in for their whole larger um, community health center funding. You know, the requirements, the federal requirements regarding governance and, and providing comprehensive services are required for both projects. So you really need to think about that. The benefits that you get for um, get, having your malpractice insurance covered, which is your tort um, insurance, as well as participating in the discount drug program and having the availability to have a wraparound Medicaid um, reimbursement. Both of those are available both for the community health center funding as well as the PHPC funding. So it's really it's really just about what your desire is. There was uh, there are a few questions about the target number of unduplicated participants or patients in your PHPC program. You know this is this is really about your community. So us in New York City are going to see a lot more people because we have more residents in public housing, but if you're in Mobile, Alabama, which one of our great grantees is, the number may be completely different. So this is really just about your local housing authority and trying to make an impact in your community. So looking at that, providing, you, you know, you providing opportunities for transportation. So for instance, if your community does not have a public a public transportation system, and you want to build in a, a van transportation for those residents to go to the main clinic site for some of their specialty care. That's something that totally works in a in an application. So trying to be create creative in that process really will um, be beneficial to your program. Um. Were there other questions, Dr. Webb? Anything um, else you want to answer? Um, I do not see any more questions on my end. Um, Devin, are there any more questions in the queue? Um, no, ma'am. That was actually the last question. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. It's now 2 o'clock. David, thank you so much for this presentation. I think you've shared a tremendous amount of information here. Um, I anticipate that we are going to get numerous calls on this as well. Um, so feel free to contact us at the National Center for Health and Public Housing uh, for any further assistance. Um, if you would like to get a little more idea or support in terms of um, assessing the need for serving residents in public housing, please also fill out online at the nchph.org website. We do have a TA request form. Um, and if you fill that out and send it to us online, we will have a staff member get back to you as soon as possible so we can work closely with you on your individual needs. In addition to that, I do want to mention um, uh, our national conference next year will be held in Denver, Colorado um, around the um, second week in June. 
Um, we will be doing North American Management. We'll be doing that conference in collaboration with the Community Health Finance for Sustainability, which is a uh, public housing special corporate agreement. So I just wanted to sensitize all of you to that. Um, and feel free to reach out to any of us for, as, um, for training and technical assistance needs. We do want all of our programs to be successful. We encourage you. For um, those of you who are FQHCs and for our primary care association partners who have members who would love to pursue this population, it is a phenomenal opportunity to really meet unmet needs in the community. So thank you everyone for joining us for today's webinar. Thank you David Vincent for once again um, doing a phenomenal presentation on the public housing primary care program. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.